despite what you might be thinking, these two circles are not equal. I repeat, these two circles are not equal. One is, in fact, larger than the other. What I need you to do is determine which one that is. So, please raise your hand if you believe the blue circle is larger than the red. All right. Please raise your hand if you believe the red circle is larger than the blue. All right, very good. Now, before I said anything about these two circles, what was your first instinct? Equal, right? Because they look equal. And the reason why they look equal is because, in fact, they are equal. These two circles are identical. <laughs> Yet I got just about every one of you to raise your hand and say that they're not. So what do we learn? That you can be manipulated like that to believe in something that goes against your natural instincts. Just, just imagine, just imagine as a child you're taught that the blue circle is larger than the red. If you say it enough times, you convince yourself that's the truth. If you're told the lie enough times, it becomes part of your reality. And if enough people are taught that lie, that the blue circle is larger than the red, well now it becomes part of the culture. And if that culture then passes that misinformation along to the next generation, well now it becomes tradition. And what we have to remember is that just because we have a tradition doesn't mean it's morally acceptable. Tradition and morality are not always the same. I mean, can you think of any traditions that we once had in the United States of America that we no longer have? That today we think back and that was immoral. Yes. Slavery, right? Less than 200 years ago. And that was a tradition. So the traditions we have today doesn't necessarily mean they're morally acceptable. And as we evolve as a culture, so do our traditions. Now, the matrix is a story. It's a story when told enough times to enough people it becomes part of that culture. It becomes the tradition. And this story is being told over and over, every day. In fact, if you believe the image on the carton is where you're getting your milk from, you're deceiving yourself. This is a fantasy. It only exists in your head. It's a blue pill fed to you by the industry to get you to buy their product. This is the matrix, the lie we tell ourselves about where our food is coming from. The reality is far more disturbing. 90 to 95% of the milk, the meat, and the eggs that we consume in the United States are coming from these conditions. In fact, every year in the United States, 10 billion, right, 10 billion are being slaughtered for food. So what that works out to be is that every second in the United States, 300 animals are killed, just like that. So 300, 600, 900, 1,200. By the time I'm done talking today, there will be over a million animals that have been slaughtered. And most of us don't even blink an eye. I mean, how is it possible that in the United States of America we can kill, we can slaughter 300 animals every second and not question that? Because of the story we've been told. The story justifies the action. If you say it enough times, you actually convince yourself that's the truth. How many of you were taught as a child you need to eat meat to get protein? I know I was. How many of you were taught you need to drink cow's milk to get strong bones? Not dog milk. <laughs> not chimpanzee milk. Not elephant milk. Not rhino milk. Not hippo milk. Not tiger milk. Not lion milk. Not giraffe milk. Not elephant milk. Did I say that already? I think you get the point. Not even our own mother's milk. But we need to drink cow's milk to get strong bones. The absurdity of drinking the milk from any other species and any other being besides our own mother when it's said enough times, loses its absurdness. Now, the first thing we've been taught is that our diet is natural. You know, we eat meat, dairy, and eggs, so therefore it must be natural. So, let's find out. Now, you have two images on the wall. I want you to tell me all the thoughts that come to mind when you see the image on the left. And don't be afraid to scream out. What do you see? Fresh, yum, sweet. Right? If I come into the room with a basket of strawberries, how many of your mouth starts to salivate? Your mouth starts to water? If I take a strawberry and I put it under your nose, what do you smell? If I take a knife and I slice that strawberry in half and put that under your nose, now what do you smell? Notice how all the sensations remain the same. You see a strawberry and it looks like a strawberry. You smell a strawberry and it smells like a strawberry. And you take a bite out of a strawberry and surprise, surprise, it tastes like a strawberry. Not exactly, it's a strawberry. But what thoughts come to mind when you see the image on the right? Cute. You know, when I go to a classroom, you'll get half the kids who say, oh, cute. Animal, pig, Wilbur, babe. So half the class will see an animal, and the other half of the class will see bacon, sausage, ham, pig, sweet pork, and hot dog. They'll see a food. It's one or the other. You're either seeing an animal or you're seeing food. 
Now, what would happen if I took one of the pigs living, brought him into the room right here, and put him, put him right in front of you? Does that change it? Now what do we see? And I mean, what would we think if one of, if one of us got up and started chewing on the pig? <laughs> Not very normal. Um, if I come into the room with a pig under my arm, how many of your mouth starts to salivate? Right? If I took a knife and I sliced that pig in half and put that under your nose, now what do you smell? Blood. You smell the stench of death. You smell a rotting corpse, bacteria, decomposing flesh. You see, there's a process involved, and I'm here today to show you that process of how you convert this animal into this product. Why should, it, why should it be kept a secret? Why should we not know what we're participating in and what we're putting in our body? Now, let's make the situation slightly more realistic. If I were to put a pig on this side of the room living and a butcher's knife on, side, on the side of that room, I mean, how many people would be willing to pick up the knife and take the life of that animal? It's very rare, right? And if somebody did that, that's all right, but how many people in this room would try to stop that person from doing that, right? Would we try that? Of course. That's compassion. I mean, that is the greatest quality in the human race. There's no other species on this planet that has that level of compassion to extend to all living beings. But if you would stop somebody from killing a pig in front of you and then go home and have this for breakfast, well, that's called hypocrisy. You know, just because it comes in a nice, neat package all dressed up in your supermarket, just because you didn't take the knife and shove it through their jugular, just because you didn't get blood on your clothes, and just because you didn't hear their screams doesn't mean you didn't participate in the killing. Every time we buy this product, we are supporting somebody else doing what we ourselves wouldn't want to do, what we ourselves wouldn't want to see, and what we ourselves wouldn't want to hear. Now, if you still see bacon sauce in the hand when I bring a pig into the room, what happens when I change it? Ah, right? It's the common response. Now, I've never heard anybody say yum. Nobody ever sees dog feet, <laughs> hot dog. So, why not? Why don't we see a food? We've been accustomed to view this animal as our pet. The cultural story for us is, this is your pet. In another culture, certain parts of the world, they eat cats and dogs. That's their culture. That's their story they've been told. And how do we feel about that? A lot of people think it's disgusting. Right? I imagine every one of you probably thinks it's disgusting to be a dog. Why would it be disgusting to eat this animal and not disgusting to eat this animal? Why would it be wrong to eat this animal and right to eat this animal? And most importantly, why would it be wrong to kill this animal and right to kill this animal? Culture. It's culture. It's the story. It's the matrix that we've been told. But culture is just a story. That's all it is. It's just make-believe. What I'm concerned with is what is natural to the human species. Because every culture has a different story. So let's take a three-year-old from any country in the world. And you put that three-year-old in a room. And you line up five animals in front of that three-year-old. A pig, a dog, a cow, a cat, and a chicken. Do you think the three-year-old is going to know which one to eat and which one to pet? What's the three-year-old most likely going to do or try to do? Play with them all. It's going to try to play with them all. The three-year-old has to be taught, no, 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 no. Don't play with him. Eat him. Play with him. Pet him. That's what we were taught. We didn't choose our diet. Our diet is a learned behavior. We were raised to perceive this animal as your pet and this animal as your food. If you don't walk outside right now and you saw somebody taking a baseball bat to a, a dog's head, what would you do? You, you, you take action. At the very least, you'd call the police because you recognize that as a violation of this animal's right to be free from harm. Now, if you were to walk outside right now and you saw somebody taking a, a baseball bat to a pig's head, would your emotional response not be the exact same thing? Of course. Because the question for you is, what's the difference? What's the difference between the two? Right? Is there a difference? You might think one is cuter than the other. But that says more about you than anything about these two animals. You know, a lot of kids will say, well, the nose looks different. But I say, they go, but they both got a nose to smell. Some kids will say, well, he's got hooves and he's got paws. I say, they both got feet to walk and run. Some kids say, well, his ears are going up and his ears are flappy. They both got two ears to hear. They both got two eyes to see. They both got a heart to beat and a mind to think. And the reason why we would take action for both of them is because we recognize the equality between them and not the difference. Any difference is insignificant. The similarities, though, are striking. We know they're equal. Yet every time we sit down for a meal, we create that separation. We create that inequality.